In, in North Carolina, but we, she's one of our leaders uh, with Advanced Carolina before she took on this current initiative. Um, extraordinarily talented and, and a plus for any organization that, that, that she joins. So um, without any further ado, um, and, and, and I'm not giving you all the green light to call her LA like we, um, if she chooses to allow that in. So, Thank you, Mr. Mo. And I, I'm also appreciative that we're recording uh, what Mr. Mo just said, because I'm going to need that on my resume. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Very deeply honored and proud to be here in person. Have, as uh, 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 Leader Matthews has already mentioned, as I call him Mr. Mo, but in respect, Leader Matthews, um, I've had the, the great honor of first meeting Eastern North Carolina Civic Group during my time as Deputy Director of Advanced Carolina and Black Alliance, that I led that role for three years. And during, and actually before I took that role, I was able to found the organization that you see up here today, Democracy Green. And so since um, I decided to go full time with Democracy Green um, and, and in concert with my family, who we are all co-founders, and so I'm president of the board and a co-founder of Democracy Green. This is our executive director, Ms. Sonia Whittington, also my uh, forever executive director because she's my mom. Uh, and so, yeah, so my training I owe it at home to her and to my grandmother and to the prayers and investment and wisdom and teachings um, so that I've been able to carry on the legacy of our people to make sure that our communities have clean, safe environments. We're talking about water today, but we know disproportionately black folks, we have the most landfills, we have the most toxics dumped into our communities, and we know that if we have high health bills, it doesn't matter what corporation promises jobs if that money is going to have to pay health and medical expenses. That's a problem, right? We can't make revenue to build our communities if we're spending it right back into medications. Or we can't get out and vote if we're rendered bedridden or ill. So the vote is impacted and impeded if either a hurricane or disaster comes through and displaces us, or when we get back home, we don't have clean, safe drinking water. And so that's an initiative that I really believe in. And very proud of Democracy Green. Masai will give a little bit more of the organization, but we are a grassroots. We started as a grassroots organization as a call to Hurricane Florence. And we actually launched a 250 person rescue. Like we literally rescued 250 people that were in floodwaters in Robinson and Scotland County. But we had also done an environmental justice 
and pro-democracy reform redistricting tour before that storm came through. So we were up in Rocky Mountain all the way down to Northampton, uh, Northampton all the way down to Brunswick. And so when Hurricane Florence came through, we had folks call us and say, we need your help if you're going to ask us to vote, if you're going to ask us to get out. We have to be safe and we have to be alive to get back to vote. And so that was our call to action. We were trained in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, if y'all know how many years ago that was. And thanks to Ms. Sonia's leadership, she said, I prayed about it and I heard that we need to go get trained on disaster relief and recovery. And she said that after meeting a young lady who escaped from Hurricane Katrina, who visited our hometown at the time. And so that training was maybe 2013, it was years after Hurricane Katrina. So Hurricane Katrina 2005, we met the young lady that survived. And in 2013, we actually had the opportunity to undergo the training. And five years later, we launched Democracy Green in Hurricane Florence. We were prepared. And so that prayer came years before we knew we needed it. All right. And so we're very honored and proud to be here. In addition to serving as a president, co-founder of Democracy Green, I'm very proud to be um, a governor appointee. Governor Cooper appointed me to the water treatment uh, certification board. So who, everyone who, who operates your water treatment plant, if you're on county, city water, our board certifies them. We test them and we approve them. If you are on county, city, municipal, and co-op, privately owned and public owned water, if you're not on well, then we're also, we manage if that water treatment plant can actually give you water or not. And so very proud to continue that work at the state level. And then this year I've been appointed by uh, President Biden and, and Administrator Regan of the EPA to serve as an appointed official on the federal level for all local governments. And that's why we appreciate the East North Carolina Civic Group being the oldest civic group in North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, because the historic legacy of improving, building, and choosing and winning elections for our people to be represented so that we can be at the appointed and elected level. So thank you for having us here and continuing this work. So Ms. Sonia, I'll turn it to you for any addition intro before we get into. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, kind of an honor to be here. Um, the former President Sears yes, sir, just right. took this one up under his wing. And I truly appreciate anybody, and I know that mothers and fathers can agree with this, if somebody's kind to your child, that means something in your heart. And I want you to know that it does. And I'm so appreciative uh, for Mr. Moe uh, organizing and bringing us together President here. Stokes. Uh, President Stokes, I'm going to tell you about the president. He showed up and showed out at our press conference. He was dressed to the nines. And his <laughs> lovely wife came out. It was 95 degrees. And he executed flawlessly, standing up for North Carolina and our dirty water situation that we have here. So he did an excellent job. And we appreciate him and and Bishop uh Trip. Bishop Trip Trip. came down, he was dressed to the nines, they were ready. And they <laughs> showed up and they did a fantastic yes. job. Yes. So we do appreciate being here. And I just love how Mr. Moe said we're gonna have a conversation. That's right. We love to just relax and just get into this because it's a lot of heavy <laughs> material. Uh we want you to feel free to ask questions, uh to elevate the um the mandate or the, the suggestion of uh, masks, we did bring some for those of you that might need them. Yep. And we're going to get ready to get started. Yep. And we also have a sign-in sheet going around, so please make sure to place your names and just fill out the sign-in sheet. And later on, once we go through um, our water quality testing training, right, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Okay, We're going to first inform you of what exactly is in your water, so you are the experts of your own water. That's the, the whole purpose of today. It's not to be an alarmist. It's just what is the state of your water as it is. And what can we do step by step to get us to the clean water we all are praying or at least assume we already have, right? Mm -hmm. And so a part of that journey is ensuring that we walk you through the details and then we'll show you how to use the testing kit. If you stay, you need to stay. To, if you want a water quality testing kit for free, they're $100. But in order for to qualify, you have to go through the training that we're about to offer following our education part. And then you'll sign this this lovely sheet that Ms. Sonia is holding. Uh, that is the consent form that just says, I want a testing kit. Here's my address. I want you to ship it to me. We'll go over in a little bit what we need details. The biggest thing is just make sure we can read your writing. Now it's you know it's, it's analog, but sometimes we'll have folks that have beautiful writing. They really do. Um, but sometimes cursive can look different depending on where you are. And so we want to make sure uh, it's clear and legible, and that your uh, if you have an email, 
we're going to ask you to add that on. There isn't a line for that, but email makes your results get back to you faster. So we'll go over that at that time. But we know some folks have already said they have um, other extenuating circumstances, and we're going to make sure to bring this training closer to the top so that if you need to leave for any reason, you'll have already been trained so you can get this for free. Okay, And this is a lead water quality testing kit um, today. You won't get it today in hand. It'll be mailed to you. Okay. Um, anything else? Because the certified lab handles um, the testing, uh, we come here to just give you education to let you know the possibility of what could be in your water. Then you get to make the decision to test it. Because okay. well, that's 100% sometimes how you know is testing it. Okay. So that's all in your hands to make that decision. Uh, when you uh, fill out this form, our office will submit this to... RTI, which is the one that's going to be testing our water, and you will have this kit sent directly to your home, free of charge. Okay. Okay. You'll follow the instructions, and the instructions were given today. Fill it out, call them. They're supposed to come back to your house and pick it right back up or drop it off at the nearest place that uh, takes those packages free of charge. Okay. We'll be a little bit more detailed. So many people, we've done this workshop quite a bit. Some people come in and they take the kits and they take them home and they don't use them. Please don't do that because they cost. <laughs> and we're very appreciative for the support that we get, but that's the one kit that maybe somebody else won't get. So, you know, and even if you're not sure, some people will take it and just not sure. If you forget, we want you to reach out to us. If we have to send somebody, dispatch them to your home to walk you through it. It's simple, but I'm just saying just from experience. Uh, a lot of people walk away with, with a different mindset. So please, if you need it, if you feel like you need it, take it. You're welcome to it. But we just ask that you please use it if you do sign up for one. That's right. That's right. Okay. But, so we've uh, we've already gone over Democracy Green again when we were formed. But again, we don't just prioritize water. We do all of the elements. We understand, and this is due to my rearing. Thank you again. Um, that we believe in the biblical accord in Genesis when God gave the first instruction to Adam to take care of what? The land. That's right. And to take care of? The fowls of the air, the beasts of the field. That's right. He said to take care of, to take dominion over. So we're talking about taking dominion over our water today. We, for too long, have just put it in the hands of others, but we're going to show you today it's a desperate need for us to get involved with that process. That's right. And now, if you don't mind going back to the first picture, and we'll just get rolling and to make a point, if you can. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, we just have this idea that this is where our water comes from, period. We don't think about where it comes from before it gets to this point. You know, we just kind of maybe concerned if it's hot, if it's cold, if it's coming out fast, if it's coming out slow. But today, we're going to take you beyond the faucet. And you'll understand more what we mean by we have to get involved with the process. That's right. That's right. And so today, again, we're going over water, but we may be back around other elements, right? Your, again, land, food security, uh, economic development so that we can make sure we are making revenue. Some folks who have land, they're not sure what to do with that land. They're not, they're not aware of certain programs that are already instituted that they could be making money off the land, leaving it as is, not even developing it. Just literally leaving it to be natural, there's programs that will pay you as an individual household to keep your land natural. Um, so there may be other workshops we come back and do. And I also want to say hello to folks on Zoom. Uh, we do have uh, some folks. I saw some leaders from the civic group, leaders from other communities, and Ms. Etlin from now from Brunswick. So hey, y'all. And we'll make sure to check um, the chat uh, pretty frequently. I'll walk over to make sure we're also recognizing if folks have questions there. Um, I'm not sure where to look, but hang on. <laughs> um, okay, so our service, when we talk about populations, democracy green, we are intentionally black led, created, and founded for a reason. The board, all the way through who's higher, black, Afro indigenous, okay, so that's another story for another time. And we ensure to serve what we call BIPOC, or sometimes we say BITPOC with a T, because black, brown, indigenous, tribal nations for the T, and low wealth populations, which does include, uh, uh, when we say white citizens, white residents, they are legally codified in this section of low wealth. So we serve everybody. But our whole point is, we understand rural needs better than anybody because we're rural. We know what it is to be erased 
forgotten and silenced. We see that a lot in the political landscape, right? Even as voters, we're dealing and struggling with saying, do you even hear us just because we're in a rural community? So that's why we prioritize these populations um, in, as Democracy Green. Our series is called What's in Your Water? And as we're looking at this slide, literally what you see written at the bottom is in our water. Disinfected byproducts, pesticides, radon, fertilizer, algae, lead, and PFAS is just some of the ones we've highlighted here today. And we will be talking about lead. We're going to lead with lead. We're going to talk about PFAS and a little bit on disinfected byproducts. Yeah, so these three today. First, we're going to start off with the element of lead. Lead is a natural element that's in the earth. Man has nothing to do with this. This is God-made, naturally element of the earth. That's right. But when you look at lead, even though it is an organic material, it's not safe. And so that's part of why we say taking dominion means understanding what is there. There's some things in nature that you should leave as be because it has another purpose. So there's good and there's also bad, right? Mm -hmm. Some of us call good and evil. But that also is within the growth. We understand that, and we're not going to get biblical religious. We don't claim the denomination as a nonprofit. But what we are saying is we understand the concept that during the fall, okay, there was uh, you're going to have to work harder to till that earth. Well, there's good and there is evil. And so you have to understand that even though this is out the earth, that doesn't mean yield it and use it, right? So if you want. And we want to elevate here how far the usage of lead goes back. Lead is harmful to the natural body. There is no safe levels of lead. Zero. Okay. Zero. And so it goes back. Now, here's the thing. What we'll find today, and we always say, Messiah says, sometimes it can be a little heavy. And why we say heavy is because sometimes we give people the benefit of the doubt. We say, well, if I didn't know, maybe they didn't know. Right? If there's lead in my water, just maybe. But, you know, there's a little voice inside of you to be like, it always happens, doesn't it? And here it is. Lead has already been found to be toxic way before America was created. It was found not only in Egypt, in, in, in hieroglyphics, in medical reports that said it was the cause of death for certain pharaohs. It was also found in Rome. The Romans used lead in their plumbing and piping as it was malleable and easy to beat into thin sheets. In fact, the word plumbing, when Messiah taught me this part, I was blown away, y'all. Because look at this, the actual word plumbing comes from the Latin plumba, and you say plumba, which means lead. That's the Latin for lead. So when you say, let me get some plumbing, you say, let me get some lead, because that's what the word actually means. So pots and cooking utensils were often lined with lead to prevent copper's bitter taste from spoiling the food. And a lot of things, and I'll, I'll pass it back over, that folks saw uh, the ruling class of Rome was the only folks who could afford lead at the time. And that's what they say was lead was a big reason Rome failed. Because all the rich folks was drinking wine. And they had them copper barrels for the wine. And they said, well, let's line it with lead so the copper doesn't make our wine taste bad. Oh, okay, I want indoor plumbing. See, the poor folks couldn't afford indoor plumbing in Rome. But the rich people could. And little did they know, all that lead surrounding them led to higher illnesses, diseases, and premature death. Now, what we want to elevate is the practice of lead came from and came over with the colonization of America. So that's where the concept of using lead pipes came from, is from across the seas. That's right. So we're going to talk a little bit more about lead and what it does. And so here it says lead is a neurotoxin that accumulates in soft tissue and in your bones. It damages the nervous system and interferes with the function of biological enzymes causing neurological disorders, ranging from behavioral problems to brain damage and also affects general health, cardiovascular, and renal systems. Lead is a chemical element for any folks who, who love to look up science or your chemist or you just interest either way. The element for lead symbol is that PB, think plumbing, plumbing, there it is. And the atomic number is 82, which means it is a, this qualifies lead, all that to say, it is a heavy metal. So we want to ground that our pipes were made out of lead. Even though all of this information is knowledge, they knew it all the way back over to Roman times. 
but yet they bought it over here anyway and made our pipes that brings the water into our houses out of this element. So lead, again, we've already said this, but to restate it, it's a natural element, it occurs in the earth, it is a heavy metal lead toxicity, disrupts the functions of the digestive system, all right, so you're eating, your nervous system, your respiratory system, your reproductive system. In addition, lead prevents enzymes from performing their normal daily activities. Lead even disrupts the normal DNA transcription process and causes disability in bones. Lead has been known to stay in your bones for 25 to 30 years because we constantly keep taking it in, it never fully releases. Yep. Yeah, this is heavy, this is true, but we're gonna keep moving. Yep. Yep. We want you to know that lead is a drinking water concern regardless of what your source is. So it doesn't matter if you're on municipality water, county water, or well water. However, how you get lead into your drinking water from the municipality angle is different than how you would get it from the L at well aspect, but regardless of what your water source is, lead can be an issue. That's right. Okay, in your water treatment plants, when we talk about county water, it has to go through these four systems. I want to pay, I want to point to where your source water is coming from. Okay, before it gets to your faucet, it's coming from that source up there, which is generally a lake. Sometimes people use aquifers, aquifers, how you pronounce that term. But from what I understand here, I think that your county gave the option for y'all to switch from the aquifer, aquifer, again, how you pronounce that. From what I understand, I think low water pressure was something that was used as a reason for giving you the option to switch over. So now you get surface water, which is going to come from That's your lakes. Yeah. That's why it's called surface, surface. water. Yeah. The surface water is going to come into that municipality and it's going to hit number one. Where it's going to begin to pull out the rocks and the dirts and debris and so forth and so on. And it's going to go to the second one, which is going to pull out more sediment. That's right. That's right. Keep on. There you go. So then after these two steps, and I'll say for folks who can't see the back, coagulation and flocculation. And those two words are just literally what Ms. Sonia said. They're separating the debris that would come with lake water or river water. So they separate it here. As Ms. Sonia said, it goes through a second process, like another rinse and repeat, to remove more sediments. So that's why it's a sedimentation phase. Then to the third is your filtration phase. So it's making sure all of that dirt and all of that debris and any kind of solids are completely out. Yeah. And now we're into the filtration going into disinfection. Mm -hmm. So now that it's going through filtration, number four is disinfection. Mm -hmm. And so it's disinfecting, and we've heard that word mm -hmm. before. We'll get, we'll get to that. To we'll get to that. But hold on to that word, disinfection. All right. Then after that, guess what? It's disinfected. It goes to your water tower. And as you use water, it comes through those service lines and goes to your house, community center, school, so forth. And when you get your water from this source, it will not have lead in it. When it's here, when it comes through this system and it lands here, it, is, it has no lead. The, your county has to be responsible. The state requires. It's a law. It has to be out of your water. However, where you pick up lead is from your service lines. The line that would be here. So the line here, that's in your streets, right? It's underneath, you don't drive on, it's underneath either the pavement or the gravel. And so once it goes through all this, if these service lines have not been replaced with something with non-lead in it, then all that clean water picks up whatever's in that service line and takes it into your house. Okay. That's another illustration yeah. of what's moving mm -hmm. So this is a close-up illustration of the service line. So you saw it from a distance, but this is hyper-magnified to your residential area. Um, and so here we call them lead service lines, all right? We're talking about today pipes that are made of lead. Does your community have lead service lines in this area? So you have the water main, which again, imagine that tower we just went from is distributing that water and it's going into this pipe, this service line. And if this pipe has not been updated, that is where it's collecting lead and other particles is in that pipe. And then guess what? passes into your property boundary where you own it, because this is the city, county, so forth, and it goes right into your house. And we don't mind pausing if, for those of you that are taking down notes, so you can write that down. Yeah. 
If you're on county water, municipal water, the only way you're going to have lead in your water is through that service line. And then the next step is going to be, of course, beyond that line, which is in your home. That's right. Okay. What? Yes. The line uh, that runs in the city park. Uh, who do you ask to see? You know, because you can't really see that line. Mm -hmm. So where do you go to find out whether it's red or whether it's PVC? Uh, I don't know exactly where that is in our slides because we do have slides. We do know now that the uh, money has been brought down, allocated for your counties to replace. But you can take back to the yes. service line and just share. There we go. The service line, your county is supposed to be up on that right now. Yeah. They're supposed to be doing what's called an inventory, service line inventory, yeah. where they're supposed to be locating those lines in their own counties. Yeah. Uh, we have a slide which may come up, but when we get to it, we'll refresh yeah. over it. Durham, North Carolina is what we found so far that has that system actually up and in place. And it's called a lead service line inventory. And the residents there can put in their address and they're giving them a $30 credit. To put their address in so it will come up on the GIS map that they already got created. That will let that resident know, yeah, you got service lines that need to be replaced. So smaller towns are supposed to be doing the same exact thing. You might not have the information online, which means you would need to make a trip to your, your county level and have that discussion about, I'm concerned about I have uh, service lines that have lead in it, and I'd like to know if you're going to test that because I, I know that it needs to be tested, and I would like that tested quickly. Yeah. And to answer the question, to piggyback, because it's in addition to about how do you know what it's made of, the county in that inventory is supposed to be logging it. Some counties may already have that system that has a historical report. That's it depends right. on their report, their, their great tracking over the years, right? Whenever this was very first put down, if they have a good tracker over the years, they can tell you when it was put down, what it's made of, and so forth. If they don't, that is supposed to be a part of this lead inventory analysis now. And when we say that it's available, literally this administration has allocated the most money we've ever seen in the history of this nation. North Carolina has been a, a recipient of that funding and it is earmarked lead service line replacement. And they now have to legally have to go through, whereas years pre prior they didn't have to, but now they have to go and do an inventory. So to the question of like, how do you know what your pipes are made of? And then this section is customer owned. And so with this customer owned, I, what I would say is don't uh, assume that they would have any kind of track on what this part of your pipe may or may not be made of. And did you have anything else? No, that's good. It's just centering on what yeah. is the, the county's responsibility. Yeah, the county's responsibility is from the curb, the water main to the curb stop. And that's what they can tell you what it is. This, however, is our responsibility as the owner, customer, to unfortunately have to do the digging, so to speak, to see what's this part. And I also like to add that's why we're very appreciative to the leadership that you have here. Yes. Because we have a limited amount of time before the elections come up. This money is here now. A lot of folks don't even know this money is here. A lot of folks in our communities don't even know this service is available. So we go everywhere we're invited to go and we tell everybody that we can that the money is here. You don't have to wait on an election to get somebody else in to bring some money in to do something. The money is here. Is here, yes. and this needs to be done, and we've got a limited amount of time to move on it, so we encourage you all to just yeah. dig in. And I do want to say, you know, as um, a C3, we are not persuading who or what to do in the elections. We use that word as a as we know what the season is, um, but that money is here to what Ms. Song just said. I want a plus one, but it takes county-level influence, the folks who live here. Not just to attend the county commissioners' meetings. We may have some commissioners in here that are doing some great work. I see a few. I see some few city council folks that are already doing great work. But be in relationship with them because we know we're undercounted in the census. When we're in unincorporated areas, we are undercounted in the census, which means they may not have you on their files to say, I know where their house is. Then it's like, well, why they skip me? Why don't I see my name on the inventory? because they're taking population data from the census. So you're gonna have to go forward and stand up and say, I'm in an unincorporated area. 
I'm on a, a on a back road where, you know, the service road ends and I live at the end of it. You may not have me down. Let me give you my information. So who are you saying that may not have you down? County. County. Well, all, say all government. Say every level government. Because your census data, whenever they take it, as we know, every 10 years, that data is distributed to every level of government. And it's used to allocate every part of the budget from disaster relief and recovery to locations of hospitals, uh, schools, Medicare, all those things that comes from the census data. And unfortunately, sometimes it is used when pulling up easy where do people live. So, mm -hmm, so every so, level. But shouldn't uh, we as citizens go to the county commission meeting and tell us that? That's exactly what we're saying. So I'm glad you. Yep. You want to make sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So please, please. And when I say not just your county commission meeting, I mean call them. Right. Okay. Go to your meetings, but call them and say I need to speak to you directly. If that gives a little bit more clarity. Question. Yes. How does a property owner tell whether it's top or lead? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, we've got a couple of things that help with that. The slide will go over there so you can have a visual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. All right, we're inching closer to that question, actually. So here's what's important. Right. So nearly all homes built before 1986. So think homes, churches, colleges, when we're talking about HBCUs, community colleges, we're talking about every institution plus where you live, where you rent. If it was built before 1986, they have either lead pipes or lead solder in the plumbing systems. And we know up to 10 million homes still have lead service lines. Now, again, we're undercounted, so that number is probably a lot larger than that. But out of the folks they do have counted, they know it's 10 million homes still have lead service lines that connect the main municipal water pipes from the streets. That's what we just showed everybody. We know there's 10 million. All right. We want to say the solder outside the pipes, the solder connects the pipes in household plumbing. And so in 1986, there was a law that was passed, the Safe Drinking Water Act. So that's why 1986 is your year. That's why it's like, okay, because there was a law passed that year where the U.S. mandated a lead-free solder for plumbing. So the age of your house and knowledge of when the plumbing was installed can help you. If your house was built before 1986, your plumbing may have lead solder. And that's one of the things that we do emphasize when we encourage people to test. If you know your house falls in this category, then please sign up. If you got a newer house, like you're looking at anything beyond that 1987 up, the law required plumbers to stop using lead. That's right. It was a mandate they had to stop. That's right. So if you haven't had your pipes updated and your 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 situation wasn't before, like I said, 1986, that's right. then you yeah, that's right. And so, again, we encourage folks who have homes built before 1986 to make sure you sign up for free water quality test kits. If you have a church, we have test churches. Uh, we've done that. And you know it's built before 1986, you need to fill out a form. Okay, it's one kit per person, but we can do churches and community centers, child care centers, and so forth if you know it's built before 1986. That's what we encourage. And one thing we want to land the plane and then we'll go to the next slide is that even though this law said plumbers, you can no longer install lead solder, lead pipes. It didn't require them to go back and dig it up. They just left it. It just said don't do any new construction with it. But the old stuff, y'all just leave it. That's why we're here to say we have to pick that old stuff up. So that's what we're talking about. And even to add when they outlawed the pipes, they didn't do anything about the service lines. Yep. That's why it remained because it didn't fall under that time period either. So they're coming around now, you know, doing it. That's right. You can have a galvanized pipe. You can have, you know, uh, a different type of material. But as those service lines are bringing lead into your home, if you looked at that other pipe that's got grease and other debris in it, it's going to catch it's going to catch that lead and hold on to it, and then your water flowing through it is going to, it's going to pick it up. Yeah. Right. And so you'll see different sections, and I'll read, right? Different sections, you see the copper pipe here, you see the parts, the components, a plastic liner, you see the dielectric union here. These are just the components that's pulling together your pipe. So look at the copper 
versus the galvanized. Okay, we know PVC is usually plastic, uh, more in, in, in touch and so forth, and white. But you see your copper tone here, your galvanized here. And so what we're seeing in the center is what happens over time is that corrosion can happen and does happen if it isn't replaced, right, for years and years and years. And those corrosion particles will then, your water's flowing over that and pulling in those particles in through your tap. If you don't take more. Okay. And so, again, I already said that as galvanized pipes, this part right here, as you see it, age, you'll see the zinc coating will erode. So when you look at it, and it leaves the pipe corrosion, all right? And so when the pipes corrode, lead, which we're talking about that, a dangerous toxin can build up in the pipes. And take note that galvanized plumbing can pose a serious health hazard. This is true if the pipes are not replaced or updated with safer pipes. So look at the differences here. We want to note the PVC pipe. So a lot of folks say that's a, an alternative, but as Ms. Sonia said, unfortunately, over time, when it degrades, the plastic parts from the actual PVC corrode and add, and the lead can stick to it and travel. All right? Go ahead, read that. It gives you another little uh, leeway as to how to detail whether or not you've got lead in your pipe. So the be best way to precisely detect lead in your water is to test it. So assuming the material is a dull gray, <coughs> dull gray color that is additionally delicate, the pipes are made of lead, okay? So assuming the color uncovered by the scratch, so we're talking about the pipes here itself, right? Let's talk about the pipes, not the water, so let me be very clear. So assuming the material of the pipes is a dull gray that is very delicate to the touch, right? You start seeing chips, things that are falling off, okay? The pipes are made of lead. Assuming the color that is scratched off or uncovered by scratching it, be careful, just scratch it, have a professional do that. This is a good test. It is a silver gray, then the pipes are galvanized steel. All right, so you have silver gray, galvanized steel once you scratch it. But if it is a dull gray and it's very delicate and it's cracking, then guess what? There's a high probability the pipes are made of lead. There's a, those are some tests to do, right? Cool. So silver gray, pipes are galvanized steel. You can likewise determine the material of the pipe by using a magnet, all right, as it will just stick to galvanized pipes. So a magnet will stick to a galvanized pipe. It will not stick to a lead pipe. So those are some tests. Yes? Uh, 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 when you say that, that, that uh, you have galvanized pipe, that is going to uh, uh, magnify the, the, the heads coming in? So to answer your question, right here it's just testing to see if you have galvanized or lead pipes. It can be, it's two different things. So this right here is just seeing which one you have. Like if you have a house or a building that's older than 1986 and you see these pipes, and you're like, well, that looks like galvanized steel. It may not be. It may be an actual lead pipe. And so in order for you to tell the difference between a lead pipe and galvanized steel is you can take a magnet and stick it to the pipe. And if it stays, it's galvanized. If it falls, it's a high likelihood that it's lead. You can also see if it's a dull gray, not a silver gray. If it's a dull gray and it's delicate, it could be lead pipes. So this is just helping you know the difference between the two. Now to go back one slide for specifically your question, this right here, when a galvanized pipe on the inside corrodes over time, those particles can help to transit actual lead inside. You don't want pipes made of lead, right? This is galvanized. This is not made of lead. Galvanized is not made of lead. But the inside, if that service line is not clean, the inside of that pipe will corrode and lead travels on that corrosion and goes through your tap. So that's the two differences. This is the inside of a galvanized pipe. When it corrodes, lead can travel in on that corrosion and go through your pipe. And if you want to know the difference to say, well, do I have galvanized steel or is all of it lead? These are how you tell the difference. So I hope that kind of broke it down a little bit more, the two differences. That answer your question. Um, is it uh, 
is what I don't understand is that because I just I just changed out uh, uh, my hot water heater mm-hmm. and from and, uh, I'm on camera work okay. and and uh, uh, I don't have uh, uh, coming in is 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 PVC mm-hmm. but uh, uh, when it comes to my house uh, 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 it's copper mm-hmm. but on my hot water heater is that uh, at the top of my hot water heater, I have two galvanized heaters. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that that when I took them off, it was corroded. Right. So now that's not lead, is it? No, no, not necessarily. No. Awesome. Okay, so you got new material and you just concerned whether your material is actually what you purchased? Well, see, uh, 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 we're just looking at that picture right there. Mm-hmm. Is that that's how the inside of the galvanized that I took off looked. But you're saying it's going to your hot water heater, yeah. which is a thinner, uh, p- uh, you know, it's thinner tubing, correct? I mean, it's not thick like that. And we're talking about what's up under your sink. That's, right. that's, that's from usage of grease and soap and all kinds of debris going down, whether it's your bathtub or your sink in your kitchen. That's the kind of corrosion that we're speaking of. I don't know. I mean, I've noticed like corrosion at the top of a hot water heater could just be from condensation and dust and other particles that's going on in your home. However, we're talking about the interior of a galvanized pipe. And if your house is older and you've had a galvanized pipe for 20, 30 years, you probably dealing with some things. If you've been using Drano at any point in time, you're dealing with some things. Because our hair will go down the drain, and you know what I'm talking about. We shave and it go down the drain, and you get a little bit of Vaseline or some of that hair down in that drain, you're going to have a situation. So that's what we're talking about when it's corroded like that. It's going to pick up lead out that service line and bring it into your home. That's why even if it's uh, the plastic pipe, it's going to pick up that lead and bring it into your home because that grease is a magnet. Yep. And we'll move on. Yep. That's what that that's what that means. What's so the inside? Yep. Now we've been very thorough about what municipality and how you're getting lead. Yep. We want to be very clear that your county is doing their job cleaning that water at your water treatment plant. Yes. There's no lead coming from there. It's going to come through those service pipes, and now is your time to get those service pipes taken care of while the money is here. Yes. Now we're going to switch and talk about how well folks get lead in their water. Yep. So this right here for folks um, that are also virtual, and I'll sure to check the comments when I pass back to you. Lead packers were sometimes used in wells drilled until 1993. Okay, now I understand we talked about a 1986 law, but you see that we're just talking about the, the piping. So lead packers were still used sometimes in wells drilled until 1993 when they were prohibited. Mm-hmm. Some submersible pumps manufactured before 1995 may contain, contain leaded brass components. Since January of 95, all submersible pump manufacturers in America have agreed not to use leaded brass components in submersible pumps. Again, 1995, nearly 10 years after the Safe Drinking Water Act. All right. Another thing that's mm-hmm. going to elevate how some of us may not realize that uh, lead is getting into our well water. If we live out in the country, we've got the right to bear arms, and we'll go to our shooting range, which might just be three steps down from an old tree. But if we're not conscious that that well is in that vicinity, the runoff from that lead can go into your groundwater. Over time, it can happen. So that's why we want people to try to be mindful of where you're shooting on your property and make sure you're not in close proximity of your lead of your well because that lead can get into your groundwater. That's right. Lead paint is another way that folks get paint. I mean, get lead into their water. Lead paint is a, a big leader of lead poisoning in children and adults alike. We've assisted uh, people, like like L.A. was saying, we don't just do water. We were able to assist a, a nonprofit with painting an old school building that had lead on it like this. 
And we always find it's an educational journey to kind of inform folks if you got that kind of peeling and you know you've got lead paint, please don't mm-hmm. attempt to handle that yourself. It's even against the law if a painter is not certified to remove lead paint. That's how dangerous that it is. So if someone shows up at your house saying, oh, I can fix that for you or do that for you, you need to make sure that they're certified. I think there's a $16,000 fine if someone attempts to take away lead paint without doing it according to the EPA standards. That's just how serious it is. But just want to elevate lead as another component of paint that can get into our water. That's right. Mm-hmm. So we also seem to read here uh, private wells and public water lead contamination um, in the mountains, which in North Carolina. There was a shooting range that was there right by their main watershed up in Asheville, North Carolina, Buncombe County. And so for years, they were not at all, you know, following regulations or even aware to follow regulations. But unfortunately, it contaminated the water source, which went to a lot of wells in that area. The okay. law enforcement used it as a training ground, and it spilled over into their water. And Asheville has a great big movement of yeah. making sure that their citizens are tested for, for lead in their water filtration systems because that situation elevated to everybody that that was a problem. That's right. And so that's just a picture of the Brevard Water Treatment Plant that's located in Cathay's Creek adjacent to Pisgah National Forest. Now, everybody's familiar with Flint water crisis. That's right. And a lot of folks for a lot of time, for a long time, didn't realize that their problem was lead. That's a problem with lead. And a lot of people as we travel around don't realize that we are Flint, Michigan. We are Flint because we have lead in our water. That's right. That's right. We're going to talk about some of the health impacts and then we're going to, you know, yep. transition. Yep. So to read again from here to magnify it, the impacts of lead, it is very severe for children during their developmental years. Uh, that's why you have health departments that test children, right, for lead. That's how we get our lead data. So that's how your, depending on, again, different governments can choose to do things. But we know standard, most counties, most governments test children. And that's how we get the lead levels of where those children live and what's in your community. Lead poisoning can impact the development of the brain. Remember, we said a neurotoxin, neuro as in brain. And so it literally impedes the developing brain. It gets into the bones. And so we know children have softer, right, bones as they're developing. And so if it's already in that bone as it's developing, then we wonder why we're seeing higher rates of child leukemia and other cancers of the bone, right? This is one of the predominant reasons. There are other, you know, health impacts from fatigue, joint muscle pain, high blood pressure, uh, all the way down to your digestive system from constipation, poor appetite, uh, uh, memory loss. Uh, so when we hear a lot of high rates of, of uh, uh, we call it, you know, Alzheimer's, where we're from is Alzheimer's is sometimes a, a quote we use, but we're seeing higher rates that we're seeing is more neuro- neurologically impacted. And so the question is, how much of that is the lead over the decades and the generations that folks have been drinking water that we're seeing higher rates of Alzheimer's and dementia? Yeah. And so already kind of foreshadowed this the slide here, but we'll give some data. Uh, while childhood cancer is often associated with leukemia, data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, found that brain cancer is now the deadliest pediatric cancer. Okay. Like we like already mentioned, lead tends to accumulate in bone regions undergoing the most active calcification at the time of exposure. And again, leukemia, a malignant progressive disease that invades bone, marrow, and other blood forming organs. At high levels of exposure to lead, the brain and central nervous system can be severely damaged, causing coma, convulsions, and even death. Children who survive severe lead poisoning may be left with permanent intellectual disability and behavioral disorder. So how many times have we heard our children are bad? Can't sit down. Can't be still. Attention deficit, right? Well, guess what? If you have lead in the body at a high level that is impacting the neurological, right, ability development, it can lead to what? Behavioral disorders. Children aren't bad. It's not genetic. 
we need to understand how much heavy metal is in their bodies and begin to be honest with that and tackle it. Each year, an estimated one million people die from lead poisoning, millions more. Many of them children are exposed to low levels of lead, causing lifelong health problems. So we think about it, if it's at the home, and there's a little bit of lead. Then they go to school, and water fountain, a little bit more lead. Then they go to HBCU or a college, it's been up, uh, they drink a little bit more lead. It's following them during the lifetime of their development. I might be telling my age, but I remember when Jerry Lewis used to come on the TV talking about Easter seals and giving money because of children with leukemia and that type of issue. Today, childhood cancers is afterward. That used to just be seemed like a, a like a seasonal advertisement that you could, that you would hear. But to see the numbers today, we can see how that has drastically changed. On our sheet, when you sign up for your water kit, you're going to see at the top. Clean water for U.S. kids. This RTI uh, laboratory already has a program that tests water in, in, for children in their schools. That's what they do. When we were doing a workshop on water, breaking down the seriousness of water, I heard a lady sitting in our workshop. She said, oh, my God, I'm, I'm scared. I don't even want great water. After listening to this workshop, I said, well, ma'am, I don't want you to be scared. We're not here to be alarmist. And that really sat down on me, and so I got in touch with RTI. And I asked them if they would start providing residential testing like they offer for schools. So Democracy Green was able to be a, a pilot, so to speak, with RTI to get this kind of testing out to residents. So your children have the opportunity to be tested in school by this organization, laboratory, their nonprofit as well. And you also have the opportunity to test in your home and see if that element is there. Like LA, uh, elevated, our children are. Um, they're assigned so many negative things, but we need to understand that there's a lot of stuff going into their bodies that is truly impacting their ability to learn. I've heard people just reports about teachers telling us that they're like teaching kids that's in the seventh grade on a fourth grade reading level. And we just wear ourselves out wondering what is wrong and why they can't learn and why they can't retain is too much. It's just too much in the, in the water. It's too much in the food. And we just have to become conscious and we have to become aware of it. So that's what we want to elevate to land the plane. So if you do decide, you've got all the information to make that decision. Yeah. If you want to ask some more questions and then come show how to do that. Yeah, we can. And President Stokes, um, who's along with us, and Mr. Sears, I want to say hello. Mm -hmm. uh, and welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, and um, also saw Leader uh, Johnson join the room as well, so good to see you as well. Um, so what steps do we uh, that are online have to do to sign up for the kit? So the form, we can send that to folks who are registered. Right? And, and if they also want to email us at democracygreendg at gmail.com, we can also send, you know, an electronic way for them to sign there and just send that file right back to us. Uh, it just whatever way we can do it. We're going to get ready to pass these forms around. We always lead with lead, even though there's other contaminations in your water, because even when it comes to PFAS, if you don't get the lead out, it's, it's not going to eradicate PFAS coming through. We are big on pushing folks to protect themselves. That's our mandate here. We're going to tell you about you got lead in your water. Let's test it if you want to. If we find out that you have tests and you go through this program, you'll get a picture straight out the gate. It's a, a zero water filter mm -hmm. that takes everything out, all of the lead out of your water. That's just the start of our conversation of what it takes to be safe. Now, if ladies, and if you don't mind, take it and pass it down until we get to the back of the room. If you want one, take one, and we'll go ahead and start that, and we'll just keep on. That's right. That's right. And so, again, for the folks online, I've already um, dropped in the chat our email and just email your uh, uh, request for the water quality testing kit. And then Ms. Sonia and our team will follow up with uh, information like the form that you'll need to sign. So just email us using the email address in the chat. All right. Hey, Ms. Ben. So what we're going to do is this is the part where we're going to walk you through how to use this water quality testing kit to test for lead. In order to qualify for the kit free, this is the part we have to go over. All right, it's the requirement from the scientists. They said legally, you have to make sure you walk folks through it. 
legally get them to sign the form, and then we have permission to test water. <laughs> yeah. Can you hold up the sheet again? Can you hold up the sheet. So the sheet that's coming around, it will look like this. That's right. It's going to say RTI. It's going to have democracy green on the other side. That's right. It's going to have a, a little logo with the top. So I'm going to walk folks through this, um, but I want to make sure everybody can hear me. I know we're passing around the papers. I'm just going to give it just a moment uh, and make sure it's traveling back. All right, sounds good. Okay, so the box may look like this. It may be completely brown, but you see that it is an express box that will be dropped off by the UPS. Okay, it will not be dropped off by another uh, courier. It will be the UPS because when you send it back, you need to send it back in this box. Okay, because there's prepaid stamp on it, prepaid postage. All right, so keep the box, don't damage the box or tape it back up because you'll need it. And then when we get finished with the steps, all right, so once we go through the steps, at the end, when you close this box back, You'll call the UPS and they can pick it up from your home or you can drop it off at a UPS store. Some folks have grocery stores that have UPS in it. You can take it back, drop it off, but you should not be paying a thing because the postage is here. But you can call UPS and schedule it. They can come back and pick it up. All right. So step one, there will be forms inside of the box. And on that form, it'll say the word chain of custody. We will be providing a video, so everything I'm saying here, as long as your email address is on the form, we can send the link. Now, I know folks are asking questions. I'm going to wait a minute. Just a little bit. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, yeah, yeah. That's, I like the good questions, but I'll wait. Okay. Yeah, I'm just giving a moment. Couple folks have a question, so I'm like, just a moment. All right, pick back up. Yes. When you're one per household, if we have additional at the end of the program, we'll call that info so we can say we have extra. But we just try to make sure at least there's one per household. Yeah, yeah. And if you put on the back of the sheet that you have a second household, then we'll have our team put it in. If we have some that are unclaimed, we'll call you and say, are you still interested in getting that second tested? So at least put on the back of the form. You have a second household. Um, but that's a great question. So just one per household. If you have a church or community center, that is second. That is second. And that's just another question. So we'll go here and then here and then here. Yes. Okay. Okay. We're passing. Okay. Okay. I didn't hear you. Okay. I didn't hear you. Thank you so much. We have both Andy Will and Miss Ashley. Andy Will and Miss
And if y'all have an email, please put your email in. Does it doesn't say it on the paper? If you do have an email, please put it at the bottom. If you have an email. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is black if you don't know what to You would church Uh-huh. And identify as for the church. It don't have to be in court. Let me see if I can get you one. Somebody ain't got one. Okay. Uh, you can't get anybody to put their hands up now. We're getting ready to get some copies. Mr. Moe wants to talk. Let me show your hands. Who needs a copy? Who needs a copy? Who didn't get a copy? Mr. Moe's going to go get us some copies if you want one today. Yeah, you gotta wait. That's nice, ain't it? <laughs> and Mr. How many does it need, Lay? Um, we have five hands go up, but I see six. I'll take at least about 10 or 15, maybe 20. 20. Hey, that, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> You can, yes, put the name of the church at the top and, and put down the address where you want it to go. Now, if nobody's going to be at the church and it's going to be at your residence because you know that's where you're going to pick it up at, then just make that note at the bottom. Put down the church address and all of that, but if you need it mailed to you, put mail it to this address. So it just ain't sitting over there, you know what I mean? <laughs> Unless you're at the church every day, you know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> look at the box over there. I'm excited for you done. boxes. Okay, this is what I was asking. All three boxes. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Leader Matthew, for going to make other printouts. We already have um, the sheet going around for folks who did get a form, so we still have it, but Mr. Mo is going to make printouts for folks who need forms, okay? Thank you for doing that. And so, if, yes, and one last thing, make sure to uh, check all, all three boxes. I'm going to be coming back around to those who don't have their boxes checked off, but check out all three boxes. The first box says that you are agreeing that the scientists can test your water. Box one and two are saying, I don't know if y'all can hear me. I might have to get carried up with this. Okay, so we can back. What's that? I'll take it out this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so once you complete your form, just put it at the end of the table. We'll let them put it at the end of the table and we'll come out and pick them up. But make sure you check all three boxes. This is giving consent to the scientists to test your form and to give you that. All right? Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. 
I'm just loud. Hey, <laughs> magnifies it. Yeah, that's good. We wanted to get a bunch of these because we got them from Amazon, and we were gonna get them and like put Democracy Green on the side, and they don't sell them to the United States anymore. They got different a different type that goes over your eyes, and I don't know how that works. But we yeah, we were gonna buy up a bunch of these because they're a lot easier to breathe in. Than the yeah, and I remember wearing the blue mask, and you know how you be trying to save some money and reuse, and you can see those fibers coming loose and inhaling it, so that's not good. So these work out really well. Now, in addition to signing up for it, you got to learn how to test. That's part of it. <laughs> you got to know how to do it. <laughs> now, if everybody needs to take a bathroom break or something, we can take a break for two minutes or whatever, or we'll keep on moving, whatever y'all want to do. you said just put out the email. Well, she uh, me. The other thing is, well, I mean, you'll be learning how to train to do it. That's one of their requirements is being trained to do it. But we understand. I mean, you know, I'm seeing the one, one for the our church. My okay, church. Sure. Okay. And the people still got copies. Yeah, I think he's going to make copies of that. All right, church. You said don't, don't, um, don't spill one out for my mother. I can't try all right, all right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We do encourage y'all to get one for your church. If you want one for your church, we do encourage that. Get some. Uh -huh. All right, y'all. I think we're ready. I think we're ready. <laughs> All right, so you have the forms filled out, and if you have them, just leave them on the, the corner table, and I'll come down there in a moment. So now that you have the forms filled out, we have to go through this part, because this is the next part you have to do in order for us to give it to you without charging $100. All right? <laughs> this is it. All right, so when you get this box, keep this box. You will be mailing everything that was in that box, but with water, back to the UPS. They can come pick it up. You can call UPS. Schedule a pickup and they'll come to your house. Or if you're outside the delivery zone, uh, which I don't see why you would because they would have dropped it off, right? So you can call them or you can go take it and drop it off at a UPS. It already has the pre postage on it. Inside will be a bag, and inside that bag will be a sheet and these two containers, all right? That sheet. And we'll email a video. So everything I'm saying here, you'll also get a video of it if your email is on these forms, just so you don't have to memorize everything I'm saying. All right. But the form that's in the box, it will be called chain of custody. That's just a fancy title for the form you need to fill out with the date, the time of when you pull your water. All right. So that's your form. 
So here's two bottles that you'll see once you fill out your form and say, hey, I'm going to, you know, take my water today, July 19th uh, at 5 p.m., 5 a.m., so forth. You'll then, what you want to do is you can't use your water for eight hours. Can't cook with it, can't shower in it, can't flush the toilet. We recommend do it overnight when you're asleep. All right? If you're a person that's like, oh, I go to the bathroom frequently, tape down the inside of that toilet so you're not flushing it. All right, just got to, yeah, we don't need you pulling the water through your pipes. We need it sitting. The longer we have it sitting, and the minimum is eight hours, we can tell how much of a concentration of lead you have in your pipes. If you constantly run out water, we're getting a little bit. We're not getting how much is coming from that source. If you need to, like, get your pitcher of water to take you through the night, if you use the sipping water through the night, yep. just get your pitcher of water, bring you a couple of bottles of water in. Yep. Like I said, take, take down your commode handle so you, you know, the habit's there, so maybe it's, oh, I can't touch that tonight. <laughs> so that'll remind you not to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so first thing in the morning, this bottle that says first draw, it literally means it's the first bottle you're going to use to draw the first bit of water. First draw. So, of course, you'll take off the lid. Don't run that water yet. Put this lid right under that faucet. We recommend in the kitchen. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, we mm -hmm. recommend if you have a filter on your house, we don't mm -hmm. need filtered water. Okay? So, we either need you to take that filter off of your sink. If you have a filter at the sink, take it off. If some people with well, they're like, well, I have a filter that connects outside. Well, you're going to have to go outside to where your well Right, spigot is coming straight out, not where it's going in the house. So you need to make sure to get unfiltered water. All right, so we know. All right, so eight hours has passed. You got the lid off, and you put it underneath your water source, and you turn that water on when it can catch it. And that first bit of water after eight hours, you're going to fill it up. That's it. Remove it. Put that lid back on it, and you can keep that water running for 30 seconds. That's the second bottle. This is called the second draw. Second draw. Because this is going to be the second draw of water. You want that water flowing for 30 seconds. Put on the microwave timer, whatever helps your phone timer. You let 30 seconds pass. Because this is going to tell us how deep the lead is coming from inside of your pipes. This will tell us just where it is. All right? So this tells us how much you have when it's collected. The 30 seconds tells us how deep it's coming. If it's more shallow, Contamination or deep contamination, all right? But 30 seconds, all you need to know, 30 seconds, and then put that bottle underneath that water after 30 seconds. Fill it up and close it back up. And, of course, try not to touch the inside of the bottle. I think it may come with gloves or whatever, so yeah. be mindful of that. And, of course, you'll place the containers back in here. You'll place the form that says chain of custody. And, again, on the form, you would have written the time that you did it and the date. Why they need that? Well, we need to know when you took it, but we've had some folks get their kids, fill it with water, and just let it sit. For months. For months. Months. That is not, that's not a viable sample anymore. Okay, that's it. So if then, you take that sample, don't let it sit beyond three days. You know, wait till you're off. If you're busy, just put on your schedule. I ain't doing nothing on Tuesday, so I think that's when I'm going to test my water. That way you test it. Tie it off, everything you need to, package it, and send it off. That's right. And uh, the lab will send it back if it's out of date. They say they can't test it. So it's very important uh, to take that test and send it in immediately. That's right. And so once you complete all of that, right, those three steps, fill out the form, get the first draw after eight hours, the second draw, 30 seconds later, you put it right back in here, and, of course, you put your posters where it needs to be, if it needs to be on here. That's fine. And then drop it off or call to have it picked up. Uh, what Ms. Sonia has done, thank you for doing this, is, again, we have a form or not a form, a piece of paper, just education that just talks about rules of engagement and kind of, re you know, covers what we just did quickly. Right. Eligibility requirements for lead testing kit. Your house, home, community center, church has to have been built before 1986. Okay, that's why you're getting this kit. You have an updated replaced household pipe in over 20 years. If it's been 20 years since you've updated, fill out a form. Uh, you uh, lead test the kit is complimentary of Democracy Green. We cover the cost. We fundraise in order to do that. Uh, must test and return according to instructions. That's what I just went over today. 
All lead testing kits are free of charge, and this includes shipping and handling. I already covered that today. Failure to use and return or return without use will resort in a charge of $100 and 55 cents. Got to cover that post. So make sure you're using it. Make sure you're confident about using it uh, because we'll then have to recover that cost for somebody else. One water testing kit per household. We said we could do community centers, churches, that's additional, but for your house, you get one house, okay? Special request for elderly shut-in health impact community members. So some of you are asking me, can I do this on behalf of someone? This is in the event of we do have a special circumstance. If they can't be here because we say the sick and shut in or there's another reason, we will make a special request and have to accommodate them being here. So if you have somebody, you know they can't make it out, we will work with them and you to make sure we get them a testing kit. All right. Um, applicants, residents, we already gone over that. Anything else that I may have missed? We, we already had some folks here today that said like their mother's not here or maybe an elderly neighbor is not here. Yeah. I think the best thing that we can do at this time is just take the name yeah. and put it on the list. And like she said, it depends on the inventory and how we'll be able to handle that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we'll be doing, uh, we're going to stop for lunch in exactly nine minutes. We have nine more minutes together uh, before we go to lunch. And we're going to, you know, fellowship. And then we'll kind of bring y'all back in the middle of that lunch hour to cover the rest. Some of you are already asking questions around what money has been received by the counties. What does that look like? How can uh, we know what it's called? Where to go when we talk to folks? What do you mean by money is there? There's questions that are coming out, and that's great. And so we want to be able to answer those questions with a few more slides to land that plane. What do we mean around advocacy, right? What do we mean around being civically engaged in that way to where you are being a good, you know, uh, uh, I would say collaborator, comrade, with your county electives as they are now deciding and have been deciding since 2021, some of them, 2022, some of them, uh, what they want, need for their community, what are they going to use the money for? Well, today we're talking about this is an issue that, well, money could be used for. So we're going to cover that um, and start that in the middle of lunch. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Let me see if that goes. Those are out of test. Oh, excuse me. Out of test. No, you're fine. If you get that question again. Okay, did you ask that one more time, please? This is built 2004, 1989. They're out of testing dates. Yes, sir. Like we presented, if it's built, like I said, after 1986, it's no longer, you know, lead was no longer used in your plumbing. So they should. After 1986. So if your house is new, uh, the law changed it to where plumbers cannot cannot use lead. And a lot of newer developments, if you notice, when they got gentrification going on, you'll see new service pipes being put in. So that's not an issue in our newer homes. Lead is an issue in our older homes. And we do know that there's a lot of uh, heirs property where we have houses that's been handed down from generation to generation. It's probably going to need to be checked. Like I said, we do have limited forms today, so if you do have neighbors or family or whatever that is in that situation, again, we just invite you to put your name on the list, and we'll give you our email address so you can get in touch with us, and we'll go forward and see how to handle that. RTI does require us to train folks to come out to our uh, workshops for them to release a kit, so that's why we do things the way we do. She's going on to click in some other slides, and a lot of women talk about maternal health and the impact. That's a big conversation, uh, black maternal health, and a lot of us don't realize that lead has an impact on the body when we are carrying our children, and a lot of the issues that is being caused in our community today comes from the impact of lead. That's right. That's right. And um, I know I want to look at few things. So everyone has their form up here. Okay, great. And let me see. So you just covered that. That's mm-hmm. great. We've already, um, and we've already covered that. We'll make mm-hmm. sure we're wrapping up. Anything else about lead? Because after this, we want to land the plane on what PFAS, P-F-A-S is. So last week, we organized a press conference, uh, one of several we've done um, over the years around this issue. But last week, as Ms. Sonia mentioned at the beginning of our time with you all today, President Stokes was able to join us last week and give very stirring and powerful testimony and words at this press conference 
and our hopes of moving in conviction our state's top agency on the environment to pass laws to remove these cancer-causing chemicals, remove them out of our drinking water sources. And so that press conference was very successful, uh, and we were out there, like I said, fighting the good fight in 95-degree weather. We, we, did, we did the good work. Um, and so we're very grateful that folks were able to join us from as far as Brunswick County, of course, Washington County um, here, uh, Martin County, and so forth, um, other areas like Warren as well. And so want to make sure if there's anything you want to cover before we go to lunch, because when we come back, we're going to cover the money and cover PFAS. So if anybody has any questions about lead before we move forward. Yeah. And that's when your test results come back in. Uh, just want to elevate here that if you're above 15 uh, milligrade, milliliters, uh, you are above the, the state level for lead contamination. That's our cutoff amount. And we did test a church that was over that limit. And it's it's like um, your water system has to be immediately shut down. Yep. It's just that critical. You go on to the next slide. Yep. And, show it. And, I, and I know some uh, folks have asked about their churches. When the forms come back with Mr. Mo, if you do have churches and other auxiliary buildings, community centers that you want to be tested, fill out a separate form for that church. That is not your household. We will not count it as your household. We will count it as its own institution. So fill out those forms for that institution. This is a moderate level of lead, but like we said earlier, what is the safe number for lead? Who can tell me? It's zero. So even if it says, you know, 28 parts per billion, that's still unacceptable because it's zero. Okay, the next slide will show. Now, that's if you get this indication on your test, it, it's, it's serious because you're above the state level for lead contamination, and you have to stop using that immediately. And we have tested households that have come back with this um, data, and we have tested churches that have come back with that. And so there was a few questions, and we'll cover this today before we wrap. Um, we, again, if you are in the red zone, as we're going to call it right now, we bring back a free water pitcher, right? That's part of our program is that if you are in the emergency zone, we're like, you, have, you need to stop drinking that water, period. There's no limit by which you can consume. It's healthy. Uh, none of it's healthy, but this is red alert. We will provide a pitcher for free. That is a part, it's a. It's not a Brita filter, y'all. Brita does not filter out lead. It makes your water taste good, crispy, but it does not actually remove that, those heavy metals. It doesn't have the technology to do it. So what we provide is a pitcher that looks like a Brita pitcher, but it is from a different company that removes that lead because it has a uh, carbon filter in the center. Folks are familiar. So we'll provide that as emergency relief, okay? But that is not a long-term sustainable, right, strategy to make sure for years to come that one picture is not it. So that's immediate relief. I also want to add, if any of you that are listening to us today decide you want to go get a zero water picture, just want to elevate that when it says zero, it strips everything out the water. And a lot of people will talk about getting headaches and so forth and so on, and that's because the water is too alkaline. You've got to restore the pH balance in the water. If you don't restore the pH balance in the water, it's going to knock your equilibrium and off because all the minerals as well as the bad stuff is being pulled out. That's the, that's the yin and the yang. It, when it pulls out the lead and PFAS, it's also pulling out the vitamins and the minerals. And it's a simple process to restore it with baking soda and salt. But whenever we do our work, workshops, we do teach you how to use it properly to bring back up your pH balance. There's a TDS meter that will help you to know how much is in your water, what the solids are in your water. We've tested it in our workshops. It will show you zero. It means just that it will strip everything out of that water. Then when you add the necessary components back in it, you get to test it again, and you'll see that number bring it up to the right amount, which is what? What is our typical pH balance? Is 7.9, some people, Seven. somewhere in there, whatever, but that's the importance if you do go get a filter and strip it all the way down, you're going to have to remineralize it or it's going to cause you a problem. And that's why we're really big on education because so many times we will do something different and we'll say, mm, no, that didn't work. Or, oh, God, that made me feel worse. And it's all because we're just not using it properly. 
So we do believe in education and want to. I just want to elevate. And that. so, as Messiah is already elevating, we're going to come back. If we invite it back, man, we got to be invited oh, yeah, we're back. Not, we're not, we're not <laughs> to be invited. Right back. And why we're going to do that, or we hope to do that, is because when you get your results, we hope to bring folks back up to a follow up, so you learn how to read your results. What good is data if you don't know what it says? True. So we're not going to just give you data and say, "Well, you have it now. See you later." No, uh, the follow up to this workshop is when you get this information and you're like, "Okay, I'm either yellow or I'm red or I'm somewhere in between." What does all this mean? We come back in, we walk you through how to read it, we walk you through your next steps, and then that's when Messiah has mentioned, we'll show you the picture, and before we put that picture in your hand, just like today, before I put that leg in your hand, into the mail, I had to walk you through how to use it. Before we put that water filter picture in your hand, we're going to show you how to use it. Which part? For the first part. Well, we hope that everyone that signed up for day, today will, when your kit comes, that you'll get on it immediately. But it starts from the point of submission, and the laboratory takes from four to five weeks. And it does depend on the season. Uh, sometimes they can have an influx of a lot of testing because it is RTI International, which means they test everyone, not just for us, but it's at least four to five weeks for the testing. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, if you don't have a leg problem, do you have a test? No, sir. If you don't have a leg uh, problem, I'm I'm begging you, please don't get a test because somebody else can use that test. So, if you know that you don't have lead, then no, sir, there's no point in you testing. This is for folks that have never tested their water to see if they have lead in it. If they've never had the county to come out and test them for anything, this is what this is about. By a show of hands, how many folks have ever had their wells tested? If you have a well, how many folks that have a well has had their wells tested? If you're on municipal water, then and you're confident that you don't have lead, then no, sir, you don't need to. You don't have to take a test. You shouldn't take a test. Just like the rule said, if your house is built in 2004, you don't qualify. If it was built in 1999, you wouldn't qualify because lead pipes were no longer allowed to be used. Now, I just want to draw attention to the discoloration that you may see over here in this banner. We've had a lot of folks that we do workshops with that is on well water talk about having these issues with their wells. The first thing we ask is, when have you had your well tested? And some will say never, even though they've had wells 40, 50 years. And what they have is ferric iron buildup. Depends on whether bacteria has gotten into it, whether it's a health problem. What we also offer is the Onyx Well Project, which is something totally different that we teach on, where we do a deep dive into wells, where we deal with this issue. That testing is going to come more through the health department because they come out and do a full panel. We're just going to check for lead, nitrates, fertilizer, iron. That's a whole totally different thing. But today, while we lead with lead, is because it's trying to get the concept of knowing what it is to protect yourself by using filters, point of use filters, that type of thing. I had all my patients leave. Well, I had a few Mm-hmm. Sure, I don't know which one yours would be, but that's good. Regional. Yes, please ask the questions and get the clarity. Absolutely, you do not have to test. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Now, let okay, 
being that you said when your house was built and from everything that you're saying, and you're on municipal water, county water. Okay, then that's more coming from that source, more so than your pipes. That's coming from your source, more so than your pipes. What we'll continue to talk about, which I think is a lot of the issue in this area, is a lot of disinfected byproducts is used in the water here. And we have some material on that as well, which means there's a lot of contamination coming into your water that they're trying to eradicate. So if the water sitting still, it's because our water infrastructures are too old and they're not purifying like those four steps that we showed you, the one through four, something is breaking down with the system if your county water is coming through and it's smelling. Something is breaking down in the system there if your water is coming through and it has sediment in it. It shouldn't have any of that in it. It's a breakdown at the process. And that's also why we want to elevate everybody getting involved because the funding is here. ARPA funding was released to remediate water infrastructure. Most water infrastructures throughout the counties in North Carolina are over 100 years old. How many of you are always reading about a water boil advisory? It's because your system's not working. It's not working. It's too old, it's outdated, and it's not working. Anytime we got a break in the main, the water pressure is too low. All of these things are a result of your water municipality. I'm talking about your county water. It's not able to handle it because the structure is too old. So you got to ask the question, what did your county spend ARPA funding on? Now, we got some excellent reports of ARPA funding being spent and saving the county. And we'll give you some positive. Go ahead and try to find the slide. I'll try to talk a little bit while you find that slide. But unfortunately, we got some folks coming through telling us that water infrastructure funding has been spent on the arts, new office furniture. And it's no excuse for me to see somebody sitting in a county commissioner meeting begging for running water in their house when the money has been given to eradicate these problems. So she's going to give us at least a positive report. It's in there. It, 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 it is. Okay. Well, first I want to say, our folks, show of hands of people who know who this man is. Michael Regan. Okay, okay. Feeling good. All right, y'all. We need to know this man. Okay. So, Administrator Michael S. Regan. He is technically speaking our president of the environment. You have President Biden, and Biden appointed Administrator Michael S. Regan to be the first ever black man to ever head the Environmental Protection Agency. He's the second right. person of color, but he is the first black man. He is from North Carolina. He is from Goldsboro, North Carolina. He is a graduate of A&T University. He was North Carolina's Department of Environmental Quality Secretary appointed by Governor Cooper before he went up to the federal level to be in charge of the environment for all the nation for the past four years. He is the one who achieved the largest cleanup of coal ash in suing Duke Energy while he was here. And he's the person who actually achieved the largest cleanup for our largest charge ever in the history of North Carolina. He charged the corporation that was at fault for dumping those PFAS chemicals. He, is, he has done the largest amount of money against a corporation ever. Most people don't sue corporations that are in that top government. He did. So we want to make sure we ground who this is, because this is who we work with that has actually moved money to North Carolina and in turn has allowed for us to have new drinking water standards for the entire nation that now requires all states to remove PFAS chemicals. This did not exist until April. This is brand new. Those chemicals were legally in the water. This is a new law, right? Come down from the White House. In April 10th. Now we have three success stories we'll share, many more to continue on, but three today. We started with doing virtual like this. We, we were in virtual because the pandemic was really still was COVID still, that's why we we're doing protocols. But when you know stay at home order was there. We launched a workshop series to teach 
people how to apply or how to work with their county state government to apply for American Rescue Plan Act dollars. We launched this in 2022 because funding was dispersed in 2021. So we were like, what's new? It just hit the state. Let's make sure that the community knows how to influence these dollars for their water and for whatever else the community may need. So we built this workshop and we collaborated with Black Alliance and another organization to do it. And so online, when we did this, we had leaders that were not elected. They were just community folks. They were just community leaders. They attended the workshop and asked questions saying, here it is, it's wild, here's a screenshot. Here's the, the leader, so fuzzy, but his name's Edward Gillian. And he asked here, how do I sign up? Tell me the details and who do I need to get in touch with? During this workshop, we answered all those questions. We also had the state agency own the actual call. Sometimes when we come in person, we'll invite the state agency head if that is the request of the piece, all right? And so we gave them the same information we're giving y'all today, same information. We told them how to do the application, and then we introduced them to the state agency head that administered the money. For 20 years, this unincorporated town, a predominantly black town, nearly 300 in population, unincorporated communities, it is hard getting them money because the county government usually doesn't have enough money. They're not usually given enough money. It's just cut it where it is. So for 20 years, this community had asked, protested to be connected to clean filtered water because their water is contaminated. They're in a county that has more hogs than people. Mm -hmm. For 20 years, our workshop in six months, they were awarded $13.2 million. After 20 years, six months, $13.2 million. Now, Governor Cooper went, did a big announcement, and that's great. Now, what I will caution, a cautionary tale, while this is a success story, I also use this as a cautionary tale. They were able to get information from us, like today, but they went on and didn't realize that once you get awarded the money, everybody's not going to be happy. And the same people that's helping you get that money, you want them to help you battle so you can get that money, so you can spend that money. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some folks that wasn't a part of this process as deeply as we were stood up and said, well, We'll take you on from here. And the people said, okay, y'all gave us enough. We'll go with them. And unfortunately, some folks in that community that didn't appreciate that their community got the water, the money, they've been fighting them every step of the way. So cautionary tale is, we'll get you halfway there. We can get you the whole way there. But that's up to you. All right. This is the exciting announcement. That's great. Testimony. Again. Now, here's a town that we were with 100% of the way. We have to not only get the money, they spent the money, and they now have a new water treatment plant, and we were able to cut a ribbon on it at the end of the year. So last year, this is Administrator Regan, and saw you myself, we were invited to go to a town of Maysville, okay? Some folks may be from, here, from there and here, or at least know somebody. Town of Maysville, Ben Jones, we were invited to speak at this press conference and to meet these leaders because through, again, this leadership, over $9 billion has been allocated to clean up water from PFAS. That ain't the only money, y'all. And from that $9 billion, $2 billion in grant funds, grant, not loans, grants, to treat PFAS for the entire nation. So North Carolina has been applying from, to this $2 billion pot. This town is one of those towns that applied. This town, they found they had PFAS in their water in 2019. And this is a testimony of strong elected leadership and strong uh, county staff. The town manager worked with the county and said, I don't think, I don't know what PFAS is, but I heard it's bad. That's all he said. He said, you know how it is. You feel, that's, you feel you, uh, we understand things a little bit deeper. I don't have to know what it is, but I've been, I'm feeling there's something wrong. He said, we got to cut the water. And he spoke to other county, his county, and they agreed to let him pull water from a neighboring city, neighboring town, but they really didn't have the budget, but they said, we're going to make it work. And for four and a half years, the people of town of Maysville did not have their own clean drinking water. So we came in last year, we joined and we announced this $2 billion. And then after that, Ms. Sonia, myself, we trained town manager Shimada Brown, 
He was already doing other work, uh, fundraising, but they needed more funding and we were able to support them with the same type of workshop, but we did it specifically for their town leadership to help them in the right direction. And at the end of that, they were able to get the money they needed and we were able to join them in December. And that's Shimada Brown right there, Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem. We were able to cut the ribbon on a brand new state of the art water treatment plant that now filters out lead, PFAS, and other contaminants. And you can go to it today. So that is a testimony of being able to go through the entire process. Last thing that we're going to have folks go through the line for lunch, and we appreciate you, uh, uh, Miss Betty and her daughter, uh, and to do that. And so as we're going to release each table, the last thing we'll do before you come back and eat is Brunswick County. Miss Evelyn was just online, but she had to leave for a funeral. That we joined them and we trained over 500 leaders last year that had never heard of PFAS. And because of that journey, we'll talk a little bit more about this, we were able to not only get them testing from the State Department, following our testing here, and because there's a special uh, law, uh, uh, lawsuit that's in their area, we were able to help them get tested by the state, and now dozens of people have free bottled water and a $300 monthly stipend for free water for the next 20 years. That's right. As of last year, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, and they'll also get a free full house filtration system. And that's based on a lawsuit that's in their area that they didn't know about. We plugged in, learned about the lawsuit, and helped connect them to it, and they're able to now get that free water assistance, and now people are completely off of both their well. This is for well, folks. They're completely off. And we stood and we did a press conference with them in the front yard of this leader here who showed us water from her faucet. And we were told by this, this young lady that her brother took the results from the lead testing kit and took it to his doctor because he's on dialysis. And because he had data, his doctor used it and said, do not drink this water. I don't even want you bathing in this water because you have a catheter. But it is because of these data, these kits, that data, that is what he took to the doctor that is even now influencing how doctors are prescribing medication for an illness they didn't have previous data to prove that they have. But now that was something that she was able to take with her brother to his appointment and get a different kind of doctoral recommendation and prescription because of it. So we'll pause there. And um, again, I, I don't think we have to release tables. Y'all go as feel so led. Thank you, Miss Betty. And Miss Betty, and, and, and I'm sorry, what's your daughter's name? Tony. Hey, Tony. Thank you for helping us. All right. If you'll go up to the table and join them, and I'll let you know what order to go. Oh, can I try to do it in color? Oh, you, that's nice. You didn't have to. I, well, I, I didn't continue.